Humanity's dream to travel to space is one that has been nurtured for millennia. From ancient societies who spun together mythologies to walk along the Milky Way, to countless kings and queens and emperors who claimed that they were ordained by higher beings that lived among the stars, to relatively modern art and stories that imagine space travel as something that would be utterly unrecognizable today. Perhaps no human dream is so ubiquitous as the desire to understand the universe beyond ourselves. Said Octavia Butler in his novel Parable of the Sower, the destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars. But in the long arc of progress that takes a civilization from being earthbound to spacefaring, there's one critical moment that makes everybody second guess whether this is really something that we want to do. It's the moment where someone's got to volunteer to go first. Like penguins on an Antarctic ice shelf, pushing a young clueless penguin among them down into the deep to find out whether or not anything in the water is going to eat them, there could well have been a moment in human history when the prospect of actually going to space, not knowing whether we'd come back alive, could have become paralyzing. But that moment didn't paralyze humanity, because when it came, one brave pioneer stepped up to take that first plunge, and his name was Yuri Gagarin. And he was a cosmonaut of the Soviet Union, the first human to ever make a journey to outer space. And this is his story. Yuri Alexievich Gagarin was born on March the 9th, 1934, in the Soviet village of Klushino. The third of four children born to carpenter Alexei Gagarin and dairy farmer Anna Gagarina, little Yuri grew up on a Sovkoz, that is, a Soviet-owned working farm located not too far from Moscow in modern-day Russia. Yuri's was not an easy childhood. In addition to spending early life in the conditions of a Sovkoz, he and his family were forced to flee their home ahead of Nazi Germany's advance on Moscow, with the Nazis raising much of their town to the ground. Unable to get out in time, the Gagarin the Gagarin family, along with many of their neighbors, were pressed into forced labor by the Nazis, compelled to work their farms under occupation on threat of deportation to concentration camps. Even in these early years, Gagarin began to stand out for a willingness to do what others wouldn't. Forced to live in a three meter by three meter mud hut with his family in his own backyard after their home was claimed by a Nazi officer, Gagarin began to sabotage the Nazis as best he could. Despite not yet even being a teenager at the time, he started his own form of resistance. Gagarin learned how to frustrate a Nazi soldier in town by messing with the batteries that were supposed to power the soldier's tank. Later, in the years of occupation, he'd take beatings from the Nazis rather than work for them as he was told, and at the young age of 10, he aided the Red Army in locating mines once the Nazis were routed by a Soviet counter-offensive. During these same years, Gagarin had ample reason to resist. His mother was hospitalized by a Nazi soldier, while his older brother and sister were pressed into slave labor and wouldn't be able to return until after the war's end. After 1945, Gagarin was able to restart his education, where thanks to a maths and science teacher who'd flown planes with the Soviets during the war, little Yuri became fascinated with aircrafts. During his work apprenticeships and his vocational study, he trained on the weekends as a flight cadet, eventually gaining enough proficiency that he was accepted to piloting school in 1955 at the age of 21. Small in stature at five foot two, Gagarin was nearly dismissed from piloting school in 1956 after graduating to fly the MiG-15 because he could hardly see out of the cockpit in order to land the thing. But after his flight instructor realized the issue and fixed it, Gagarin's skills went through the roof, and so did his confidence in the cockpit. After another year, year and a half, Gagarin was commissioned as a lieutenant, going to work at an airbase close to the Norwegian border. But as much as Gagarin was clearly talented in the cockpit, he had his heart set on more than just flying fighter planes. By 1959, Gagarin had grown an interest in the Soviet space program, which by then was several years into launching spacecraft. In that year, the Soviets would send the Luna 3 spacecraft to photograph the far side of the moon for the first time, and Yuri, by now a well-respected pilot, was recommended to the space program as a prospective cosmonaut. Happily married and holding the rank of senior Lieutenant Gagarin had already made it to what many would rightfully consider the big time, far from his childhood village. But Gagarin wasn't looking for any of that. He wished to go where nobody had gone before. When Yuri Gagarin was undergoing his selection and training into the Soviet space program, he did so in a time when neither the Soviets nor the Americans knew quite what to expect when the human body was willfully ejected from the Earth's atmosphere. However, by the Soviets' logic, there was at least one group in society who should be fairly well-equipped to handle whatever nonsense was going to happen up there. And that would be fighter pilots whose bodies were already acclimated to high g-forces and whose minds were well trained in managing a piece of equipment where their ability to operate it successfully or failure to do so was the only thing separating them from death. The best and brightest of the Soviet Union's fighter pilots were invited to the Vostok program, the initiative that was meant to place a Soviet citizen into low Earth orbit for the first time and get them back home safely. Gagarin, like the other fighter pilots of his day, was screened for physical and psychological suitability, while any pilot under 25 or over 30 or heavier than 72 kilograms or 159 pounds or taller than 1.7 meters or 5 foot 7 were immediately disqualified. Gagarin at 1.57 meters 
meters or five foot two, met all the criteria, and with his flying aptitude, he made the Soviet Union's initial shortlist alongside 153 others. From there, the 29 most physically well-suited candidates were forwarded to the Soviet government, who chose 20 of those 29 to begin the real work of training as a cosmonaut. Gagarin was brought to train at an airfield in central Moscow in an intense and physically demanding program that emphasized the sort of strength and endurance capabilities that cosmonauts would need to survive liftoff and descent back to Earth. Then they were trained as parachute jumpers in a range of different conditions, giving their trainers enough data to suss out who among the candidates had the best chance of success. Both Gagarin's peers and his educators seized on his demonstrated abilities, with his colleagues speaking highly of his potential and nearly unanimously choosing him in an anonymous poll when they were asked who, besides themselves, most deserved the opportunity to be first in space. With such a resounding support from his compatriots, it should have been no surprise to Gagarin that he was chosen for yet another whittling down of the candidates into what was known as the Vanguard Six. Unlike their peers, the Vanguard Six were assessed to be capable of accelerated training due to their clear aptitude. Taken for advanced education and physical testing, Gagarin was exposed to experiments that were meant to push him to the brink. Oxygen starvation tests, G-force experiments in a centrifuge, and in Gagarin's case, a 10-day stay in complete isolation in a room designed to completely dampen sound from all sources. Now, for most of us, this is a hell we should hope to never experience. But for Gagarin and the other candidates of the Vanguard Six, it was a critical measure to determine who among them could keep a clear head and return to Earth safely if they would have some sort of prolonged emergency on board their craft. Passing his tests with flying colors, as always, Gagarin moved on to an examination period conducted by evaluators from a Soviet commission. When his performance and that of the others of the Vostok Six were weighed against each other, Gagarin was identified as the best candidate of the program with German Titov and Grigory Nelyubov chosen as his two backups. From there, it was all academic. Gagarin was brought to the launch site where he would blast off. He conducted training with the spacecraft that he was to ride into space, and he stayed healthy, fit, and prepared for the day that he, a humble young man from a humble little farm, would lead the way into space on behalf of of all humanity. When Yuri Gagarin took his flight into the cosmos, he did it on a craft called Vostok 3KA3, better known as Vostok 1. A small, near spherical capsule with a tiny cabin, Vostok 1 featured only two windows, no ability to maneuver or land, and room for about 10 days of provisions in case Gagarin got stuck in space and wasn't able to return to the atmosphere as planned. That's indeed why he spent 10 days in isolation. Gagarin's role was to blast off into space on the Vostok K rocket, a two-stage rocket with boosters that took a total of about 11 minutes to get into space before hanging out in orbit long enough to circle the world one time. After that, the capsule would re-enter the atmosphere, and Gagarin was expected to eject and parachute down to the ground. If that plan sounds, well, shall we say, absolutely terrifying, well, that's because it was terrifyingly risky, the sort of journey that no space explorer in their right mind would take on today. But for Gagarin, it appears that that incredible risk was just a part of the job. On the 12th of April 1961, in the early hours of the morning, Gagarin was strapped into his rocket and prepared to be launched into space. His words to the control room were, off we go. Goodbye until soon, dear friends. With that, Vostok 1 was off, and within a little less than two hours, Gagarin had done it. In a flight that orbited the Earth for a total of 108 minutes, Gagarin completed a full cycle around our home planet before it came time to start careening back towards Earth again. As his capsule plummeted towards Earth, Gagarin ejected at about 7,000 meters and used a parachute for the rest of the way down. He crashed down near some potato farmers in Kazakhstan and understandably scared the shit out of them. The news of his survival was cause for celebration across the Soviet Union and the many global nations it influenced and a source of somewhat grudging acceptance and even respect from the Western scientific community. Although Gagarin's ejection from his capsule was kept a secret for some time, due to a technicality in which his record for space flight during Duration, altitude, and such might not have been recognized if he didn't land with his vessel, it turned out there was no reason for concern. Once the news came out, the certifying body changed its rules in order to recognize Gagarin as the first ever human to travel to space and ever orbit planet Earth. At home in the Soviet Union, Gagarin was given a hero's welcome with demonstrations across the Union that were second in size only to the celebrations of victory in World War II. Every detail of his experience and his biography were made available to the global press, and he received not only a warm reception from the highest ranking Soviets but permission to travel around the world and visit roughly 30 countries. He became a global phenomenon, and rightly so. After all, he'd more than earned his place as the poster boy for human exploration, with a status so big that he very nearly transcended the Cold War. In life after Vostok 1, Gagarin would give insight into the profound nature of what he'd experienced. Often his recollections were centered on the closeness between what he'd felt in orbit and what he'd imagined might come from a higher power. To quote him, an astronaut cannot be suspended in space and not have God in his mind and heart. So too did he make a point to emphasize the value of what he had seen. Amidst the looming shadow of a Cold War, war that in his day 
was very close to going hot. He said, Orbiting Earth in the spaceship, I saw how beautiful our planet is. People, let us preserve and increase this beauty, not destroy it. And similarly, he said, Looking at the Earth from afar, you realize it is too small for conflict and just big enough for cooperation. But at the time, for a civilization that was still far from the detailed images we see of our universe today, perhaps Gagarin's most important writings were for a sort of self-portrait of our planet. Quote, What beauty! I saw clouds and their light shadows on the distant dear Earth. The water looked like darkish, slightly gleaming spots. When I watched the horizon, I saw the abrupt contrasting transition from the Earth's light-colored surface to the absolute black sky. I enjoyed the rich color spectrum of the Earth. It's surrounded by a light blue aureole that gradually darkens, becoming turquoise, dark blue, violet, and finally coal black. Now we would imagine that the next step on Yuri Gagarin's journey might come as a bit of a surprise. Gagarin's world-changing first space flight would be the only flight that he ever took. The reasons for this mainly lay in optics. For the Soviet Union, it didn't matter much how incredibly skilled a cosmonaut Gagarin might have been, or the fact that after his first flight, he was the only experienced space traveler in the entire world. No. Instead, all of that paled in comparison to his value as a visible representative of the Soviet Union's achievements, traveling around the world on behalf of the first nation in the world to put a man into orbit. As such, Gagarin was quickly integrated into the Soviet party structure, serving in political positions, including as a committee member for the Young Communist League. During that same time, he was active in working on spacecraft design, specifically for a craft that could be used more than once, and he continued to advance through the Soviet military structure, eventually receiving the rank of colonel. By that point, Gagarin was too important to risk him by throwing him back up into space, so the contact he did have with the cosmonaut program was as the deputy training director where the next generation of cosmonauts learned their craft. But these years of fame and fortune, and quite possibly the irreconcilable memories of what he had experienced in orbit, didn't seem to agree with Gagarin. First, he developed something of a drinking problem, in sharp contrast to his prior status as a relatively mild drinker. Then his flight skills began to atrophy, and he began to gain a good bit of weight. Five years after his last flight, he re-qualified as a fighter pilot and was made a backup pilot for the Soyuz 1 space flight, where his friend Vladimir Komarov would die in a crash following multiple system failures. These were failures that Gagarin himself had strongly implored his superiors to pay attention to, and when they hadn't, he had personally tried to explain the situation to Komarov so that he might be able to deal with the crisis if it arose. But all that came to nothing, and after the crash, Gagarin faced personal repercussions. He was barred from training for spaceflight in the future, and he was barred from participating in any space flights, and was told that he could no longer fly Earth-bound aircraft without a co-pilot. To an extent, Gagarin was able to cope with this loss. He finished a degree in aerospace engineering and argued hard for the reinstatement of his right to fly as a solo pilot. But all that work, tragically, would count for nothing in the end. On March the 27th, 1968, Gagarin's life came to a premature and utterly unexpected end. On a routine training flight from an airbase near Moscow, Gagarin and his flight instructor would crash their MiG-15. The reasons for the crash became the subject of intense debate inside the Soviet Union. The KGB claims that air traffic control had led Gagarin astray, creating the conditions for an unrecoverable spin when something went wrong with his flight, possibly a bird in the engine, possibly a sudden move to avoid another plane. A separate crash investigator suggested that events may have been left open in the cab leading to oxygen deprivation bad enough that the crew couldn't keep control of their jet. Other theories run the gamut from turbulence caused by a nearby plane breaking the sound barrier to Gagarin and his flight instructor going into a dive to get their oxygen saturation back, but passing out as they dove toward the ground. Regardless of the exact cause of the accident, the result was the same. Yuri Gagarin, the first man ever to go to space, was dead at the age of 34. His remains were interred in the Kremlin War Necropolis alongside many famous figures of Soviet history, and he was survived by his wife Valentina and his two daughters, Yelena and Galina. The date of his first flight, the 12th of April, lives on in modern-day Russia as Cosmonautics Day, while that same evening features Yuri's Night, an international event that commemorates milestones in space exploration. His likeness has been made in statue several times. His name has adorned everything, from buildings to streets to ships to entire towns. And American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left a medal commemorating his life on the surface of the moon. If he were alive today, Yuri Gagarin would be 89 years old. He would have lived through the first moment the man stepped foot on the moon. He would have seen rovers touch down on Mars. He would have watched the Voyager probes cross into interstellar space, and he would have seen any number of incredible images depicting the galaxy that we live in in far greater detail than Gagarin himself could have ever imagined. Instead, it's his memory that lives on today. It lives on in the minds of every person who has ever dreamed of traveling among the stars, whether they know the name Yuri Gagarin or not. Because with an achievement so vast, so important, and so incomprehensibly big, somebody had to do it first. And that somebody was Yuri Gagarin. And we're forever grateful for what he did.